What if you have spent all that time and effort getting regulatory approval, building your product, getting customers, and then you find out there is no significant economic value and people aren't prepared to pay the price that you're going for? What we see in medtech is kind of people kind of get an incredible amount of seed funding or series A, series B funding. They go straight for regulatory approval so they're on market. And then they try and figure out the health economics of it. It feels to me that it's slightly, slightly too late because you haven't de-risked. Health economics can really be split into three stages. And the first stage really should be done as early as possible. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Health Tech Podcast. I am delighted to be back with my, I was going to say colleague, or friend at this point, Hugh Harvey, a fellow bootstrapped consultancy slash agency model founder of Hardy and Health. Um, Hugh and I, well, we catch up a, a fair amount, don't we, about the uh, the intricacies and uh, wonders of running businesses like ours. Uh, somewhat of a mentor to me, I'd actually say you've been. Um, Help me through some of those, uh, oh God, this thing has happened <laughs> moments. Um, but yeah, you've been on the podcast a few times, mate, talking about AI and regulation and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, looking forward to getting back into it. But uh, yeah, how are you, mate? How are you? It's been a while. Doing well, James. Busy as always. Thank you. Busy is a good thing, of course, in uh, in our worlds. Um, yeah, how 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 things been? It's, I don't know, probably... It's been a few months at least, might have been a year, time time goes so quickly as, as in our game, doesn't it? But I don't know how long it's been, but yeah, bit of a bit of a flat year, bit of a down year for many, many, many startups. I imagine they all still want to get regulated though, you'd certainly, you'd certainly hope so, particularly the newer ones. Yeah, what, what's it been like over the last sort of year or so for you? It's been interesting. I think we've come out of this post-COVID era, which saw an incredible amount of excitement and funding go into health tech. And we've come out the other side and pretty much has followed Gartner's hype cycle where it sort of dropped. I wouldn't say plummeted, but I gather sort of total VC health tech funding is almost halved in 2023 compared to the previous years. That said, we've been still keeping relatively busy, at least on par with 2022 um, and growing since 21 and 20. Um, but what we're seeing is a maturing in the market as well. It's no longer two or three person startups it's, it's bigger companies with bigger funding and also some of the bigger players are coming to the to the market as well and by the market i mean the software as a medical device market which obviously includes ai driven health tech so it's it's it has been um a slightly flatter year i think across the market and there's been big regulatory changes as well you know um we've had the eu ai act has come into force finally it doesn't impact anybody yet. There's a transition period, but people are starting to ask questions about that. The MHRA in the UK, who I advise as well, are working on their roadmap to try and differentiate somehow. Um, they want to differentiate, but also harmonise. So it's it's a fine line that they're balancing in terms of making a regulatory environment that's pro-innovation, but also not a lower barrier significantly than everybody else in the world. Um, so it's been fascinating. And of, of course, you know, I don't just focus on, on regulation. Increasingly, we're looking at the health economics behind these technologies. So we've actually just finished a couple of really big health economics mm -hmm. projects, looking at the value proposition of certain AI systems um, with some positive results, which is actually very exciting. A few questions on that, right? EU AI Act, what is that? So it's it's the world's first attempt at regulating um, artificial intelligence with a sort of futuristic look at, you know, what would happen if we ever got to artificial general intelligence. Oh, and wow. How, okay. How do, we sort of safely, how do we safely get there as a civilization? And it, it, it took a long time. It took three years for the European Council and various member states to <laughs> argue about it. A, lot, a lot's happened bef since starting it to finish it. <laughs> I imagine there's quite a lot of updates that it have has. to happen in the middle of that. And there was a lot of lobbying from bigger players trying to water it down, as as, as always, when any new yeah. law comes into into place. But it's been agreed now, and in essence, it, it, it regulates all artificial intelligence across all sectors. And 
it divides um, AI up into different risk categories. They are not mutually exclusive categories, but in essence, you have sort of lower risk categories, which require very little oversight and regulation. You have a high risk category, which includes specifically medical devices. And then you have a prohibited or illegal category, certain AI systems that you're not allowed to build. So um, you, you're not allowed to do things you know, like they do in China, like scan everyone's faces and find them for crossing the road automatically and things like that. So that's good. Um, it also sets fines and penalties. So there is teeth behind the AI Act. You can be fined up to 35 million euros for being in breach of it. Ooh. So um, probably worth checking that you're not, you know, <laughs> breaking the law <laughs> if you're selling AI in Europe. But the, the focus on medical devices is, is interesting because what they did across the AI Act is they recognized that lots of different industry sectors already have their own regulations. So you know, automation um, of, of, of driving cars, it already comes under regulation on, under you know, the road laws and things. Or automation in flying planes comes under the aviation regulations. So they've, they've explicitly said that if you are already a, a, a product that is already you know, regulated in that sense, those regulations still apply. There's just some additional considerations under the EU AI Act. And a couple of couple of the things are quite interesting. Um, one is that companies have an obligation to be more transparent about the data that they've used in their training. Um, and this is explicitly targeted at, at big corporate companies, companies like ChatGPT and OpenAI and Microsoft and Google and the like, explicitly so that copyright holders can can uphold their legal rights. Um, so that's going to be quite an interesting space to watch. And other parts of the regulation state that, you know, you need to have an appropriate quality management system. So anyone who's mm. built medical device software and got it regulated will know what a quality management system is. But the European AI Act is now saying that any uh, high-risk device or, or of concern needs to have a quality management system as well. So I think we're going to see a lot of, of, of regulatory stuff happening around not just the medical AI, but across sectors, which is a good thing. And some people say, oh, but this is stifling innovation. But you've got to look at the other side of the coin. This is actually protecting people from, from harms. And there's one important sort of phrasing in the EU, EU AI Act. They say um, certain AI systems can pose systemic risks. And what they mean by that is risks that can propagate across systems that, if, if left unchecked, can cause extensive damage um, to data and people at a massive scale. So that's really where the regulation is. It's not so concerned with the single intended use or, or, or use case of a single AI system. Right. It's more than systemic risks, which I think is, is, is a good thing. Yeah. So that's it in a, in a nutshell. I mean, th th there's loads more to it. It's 300 pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah of course. Much. Yeah, it's a funny line, isn't it? Like you say about stifling innovation versus uh, you don't want to stifle innovation you want to be pro innovation but you don't want to lower the barrier to entry or indeed to regulation getting certified and, and just being safe it's as you say it's an incredibly fine line to walk and actually that affects the use of it, well, like what what it can practically be used for, and therefore what the actual value is to the system. If you start clipping its wings too much, it gets less useful. If you let it run wild, it's incredibly useful but incredibly safe. And so, built into that, right down the middle, in the sort of perfect zone, is I suppose an AI that can be regulated that has an excellent value proposition provides so much value to a healthcare system and is economically viable at a price point and blah, 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 which is this piece of work that you mentioned just before about you've just done these big health economics pieces where you've discerned these value propositions of these AI systems. I'm not sure how much you can say about them specifically, about these ones specifically, but what goes into that? work in order to actually define this <laughs> like the reason that i ask is because i think when people start 
tech companies for healthcare, they'll have an idea of how it might work, how it might have value, how the tech might get regulated. And all these things come into focus down the line. After seed funding, they'll get an MVP. After the MVP, they might do a couple of pilots. And then it, at some point down the line, it prompts, I imagine, this piece of work. So my first question is, like, what stage of companies actually asking for this? And the second thing is, like, when you're crystallizing all of this stuff, like, what actually is the value of this AI and how do you discover it? it is, it's a really fascinating area of, of health tech. And I want to just pull back and just say, look, big pharma and big medical devices companies have been doing this for decades. And right. they, take, they take a risk-based approach on these exact questions that you're asking. So let's look at a big pharma company. When they want to develop a new drug, they will do R&D to identify new molecules. They will do stage one studies, maybe on cells, maybe on rats or mice or something before moving on to humans. And at that stage, they'll, be, they'll start to think about doing preliminary health economic analysis to say, look, if this does work in humans, what do we think the benefit will be? What do we think the price point will be? And then they go on to their stage two, stage three, stage four studies. What we see in med tech is kind of people kind of do the opposite, is that they get an incredible amount of seed funding or series A, series B funding they go straight for regulatory approval, so they're on market. And then they try and figure out the health economics of it. Yeah. And it, it, it feels to me that it's slightly slightly too late because you haven't de-risked your technology. What if you have spent all that time and effort getting regulatory approval, building your product, getting customers, and then you find out there is no significant mm-hmm. economic value and people aren't prepared to pay the price that you're going for? So health economics can really be split into three stages. And the first stage really should be done as early as possible, which is called early economic modeling. And this is just a process by which you map out the healthcare pathway as it currently stands. And you try and figure out what are all the cost units or cost centers within that pathway. So, you know, know, how much does it cost for a GP to see a patient? How much does it cost for a referral to a specialist? How much does it cost for them to do X, Y, Z tests? How much does it cost for a multidisciplinary team meeting, etc.? And then you map out the care pathway as it might look like with your intervention in place. And you try and think about well, what are the added costs and where are we saving costs? And you have to think of both because obviously the added cost is the purchase of your system and the ongoing maintenance for it. Um, and then you have to look at the cost savings. And this is where um, people often come to us saying, well, we thought we would be cost saving because we're saving doctors time. And actually, when you do the modeling, that actually doesn't really have much of an impact because doctors don't get paid per unit time. We just no. get paid to do as much as we can do in a certain period of time. I, I can um, I can remember about, it was probably about 10 years ago, uh, I was having a discussion with a a finance director of a, of a hospital about this exact thing. And there was a tech company that was on on my shoulder saying like, I'll just tell them that we'll save an hour of doctor's time. And the finance director said to me, well, what do you want me to do? Sack one in 24 of you and get my money back because that is not a cash in hand saving. If I'm going to realize that cash, I've got to fire one in 24 doctors. And I don't think that is going to go down very well. So yeah, very interesting. It is exactly. And so um, I, I guess the counter argument to that is, well, actually what they could do is release some of that doctor's time to do other work so they don't have to Indeed. hire other doctors. But it's quite hard to link that directly to the impact of the technology itself. Yes. The second issue in, 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 in the healthy economic modelling is often that the intervention or the technology that you're, that you're deploying is often paid for by one department in a hospital. So I, a lot of these devices are radiology devices. So I use this as an example. So right. the radiology department is the one paying for the chest X-ray AI or, or whatever it is. But the benefit is actually to the respiratory physicians. Or yes. indeed, it's a societal benefit in that society as a whole is healthier. So often it's not the radiology department who actually sees any cost savings. They've just spent mm-hmm. the money. They've used the AI. The bill. Other people benefiting from it. And it's super important to understand 
the money and f- follow the money, follow the cash flow through the hospital system and figure out who is saving costs and where. And this is the kind of work that, that, that we've did. We've just been looking at AI for lung nodule detection, not in a screening population, but for incidental lung nodule detection. So these are patients who are having routine CTs of their chest uh, for other reasons other than, you know, they're not suspected to have lung cancer. And the AI is picking up lung nodules incidentally. Now, of course, the upfront cost is you have to have, you have to pay for this system to be running. And of course, when you find more cancers, that costs money because you are now finding X percent more cancers per year and cancer is quite an expensive thing to treat. But what we've managed to demonstrate is that the cost benefit isn't for an individual hospital. It's for populations of 5,000 patients or more at a time. And in fact, the bigger you scale the population, once you get to 100,000, you are saving money. Um, Mm. We've managed to identify a price point for that product, which is acceptable to the company, the developer, and should be acceptable to the NHS as a whole. So the argument is, is to take that healthy current model to a body such as NICE and say, look, it's not the individual hospital who's going to benefit from the cost savings. It's society as a whole. Because if we look at the downstream impact of detecting incidental lung nodules and appropriately managing them earlier, we stage shift disease to earlier stages of cancer, which are more treatable, and therefore more people live longer, healthier lives. So you have to think much wider than just the radiology mm. department that you're deploying this technology into. A quick question. So you now submit that to NICE, and NICE are now going to make a, a judgment of what they recommend. What do they actually then do? Do they go over your economic study, report, model, all of the, every assumption you've made, do they then go through that with a fine tooth comb or do they just do their own new thing now completely separately to that? And what you've done is just enabled the process to begin. Like what, what actually happens with NICE at that point? That's a really good question. Um, they actually do a bit of both. Um, they will convene an expert panel of clinicians and other stakeholders who are involved in, in, in the pathway at question. They will ask you to present all of your evidence, which is both clinical and health economic, and, you know, some of the implementation science. So how, how do you actually deploy this? Right. What, what are the training materials? Uh, and they will tear apart your health economic model. They will tear apart your clinical evidence. Mm. They, they will, as you say, pick through it with a fine tooth comb. And sometimes they will build their own health economic model if, if yours hasn't gone far enough or they have questions or concerns around it. So they often do that as well. And that can be a long process. I believe it takes over a year to go through a full oh. nice medtech submission, a full full HTA, they call it, health technology assessment. Um, but NICE are now offering an abbreviated sort of version called early value assessment, where they might look at a conceptual early economic model. And you can present your early conceptual model to NICE and discuss it with them. And then you can agree what economic data and metrics and outcomes you should go and study in a real world prospective study. So, yeah, they are like the purveyors of, of super high end um, quality around this. And that's why they're regarded globally. And other countries around the world, once NICE approves something, they, they take it seriously. And the NICE frameworks are essentially copied and pasted around the world um, because it's, it's seen in such high regard from, from its rigorous approach. So it, it, it's not an area, again, like I said before, for two, three man startups. You, you need serious funding. Yeah consideration of these of these issues yeah in that scenario where you're talking about crossing budget boundaries so someone spends but someone else saves you talked about it at sort of interdepartment level but you also talked about it in terms of well healthcare pays and society benefits we're then sort of entering into sort of politics and lobbying and it gets into a really sort of fuzzy territory of how do you even now start justifying this stuff my question i guess is well in part you must you might actually have to deliver some bad news here when you're doing some of these health economic studies too and like there might be this pressure on you to just sort of find a way i guess 
which is a an interesting and difficult sort of position as the person being paid to do it, which I imagine causes a bit of friction sometimes. But where it is at that kind of interdepartment level, what it, I mean, do you do you guys make recommendations, or is that up to then the company to decide once you've kind of figured that out? You go, well, radiology pays, but respiratory saves here's the information you just need to figure out what to do about that like where does your jurisdiction sit in terms of that stuff so, so we act as a completely neutral and independent sort of um yeah. economic modeling you have to, i guess yeah you, you have to be and and you're right often we, we've, we've done quite a few of these now and often the we the, we test the value propositions that, that the companies come to us with and we do stakeholder interviews and we ask clinicians and other stakeholders what what do they think the value propositions are. Um, mm-hmm. And even they can get it wrong as well. We did one with um, fracture detection in, in, in the emergency department. So this is AI looking immediately at the point of care on all plain film x-rays, hands, knees, hips and things, mm-hmm. trying to detect, to, to, to detect fractures. And everyone thought the value proposition would be, well, we're going to get you know, more appropriate referrals to fracture clinic, we're going to be able to discharge people. But actually, the highest value was reducing the cost of litigation to the hospital. Because MSK or musculoskeletal injuries, which are misdiagnosed, are one of the biggest um, sources of lawsuits against clinicians and hospitals. Mm. So actually, the value proposition was something that no one had really considered. And in fact, when you do a sensitivity analysis on the economic model, what that does is look at all the components of value that you've identified and you tweak the numbers of a certain percentage up or a certain percentage down. The one that was most sensitive was, was, was the litigation side of things. So it's super wow. fascinating to see. So when you say who's saving money, well, it's, it's the entire hospital is saving money because right. ideally they're going to miss fewer fractures. Yes, it might be the radiology or the A&E department in that particular example that, that is paying for it, but it's the hospital as a whole that benefits because they, they might, you know, even if you can avoid one lawsuit, you could save a million pounds in a year. So <laughs> it's a way bigger value proposition than one or two appropriate referrals per month. So that's really interesting. That was actually going to be my next question, which is, which was going to be, you know, when, when doing all of these economic analyses, like where do you see the most sensitive number and actually, like it's sort of pointless me asking, like, what are the next three? Because the next three don't even accumulate to that one. So I guess is is this a is this a a point now where actually, if we're trying to consider, if if people are sat around the table right now thinking, you know, what what is the what is the startup we want to develop, and how are we going to develop a model for it? Is that, is that actually a number that people should really be focusing on to think, well, how could we leverage this as a way of actually financing the entire model? Uh, absolutely. Um, and that's why I go back to the, the necessity of early economic modelling. Because mm. I think, from my experience, at least, startups either approach healthcare from two, from two different directions. One, they've got access to a data set, so they built a model based on that data set not the economic viability of the product. Um, and so they often struggle when they get to the economic thing. Or two, they approach it from a problem that they are passionate about. They've been involved yeah. with it. This is a specific problem. But that problem is not big enough in monetary terms to be worth solving. Mm. And so doing this early economic assessment can de-risk. And, and in fact, it's really important to have these go, no-go decisions in your, in your journey. Um, and if economic evidence cannot be generated to show a significant return on investment or, or saving for somebody, then you have to just swallow that bitter pill and say, look, this is not a viable product or business model. These health economic models don't sound particularly budget or cheap here. Like we're talking about a lot of work that goes into them, a lot of study, a lot of analysis, a lot of, yeah, just a, a lot that goes into this, right? So there's a bit of a tension between you need to be so far down the line in, in order to afford it or you need to have ra- done a significant raise in order to afford it versus you need to just get going and if, if you're early, you need to do so, you need to get to a point where you can afford it. So I guess there's a tension there. So what, what, what do you advise, I guess, with the, all this in mind, if people are early, they have these ideas, they're thinking early on about the model 
what is the advice here? Is it to is it to talk to certain people and actually get certain information directly from some people? Or is it more than that? Is there a piece of work that people can do in a model early on that isn't expensive to execute? Yeah. So first of all, it's not as expensive as the regulatory process, in my experience. Right. Whatever your budget is for regulatory, you can spend a bit less and, and get your full health, health economics. The second thing is that a lot of this is grant fundable as well. And by doing, by doing an early economic analysis, you will know all of the data that you need to collect and you can then put that into your investigational protocol for your clinical studies because you're going to have to do clinical studies anyway, right? Mm. And a, good, a well-designed clinical study will have your primary and secondary clinical endpoints, but they have tertiary or, or, or more health economic endpoints. So you want to be able to engage during your clinical study and say, look, I want to know what is the cost per time or cost unit of all these different factors in the care pathway that we've identified from our early economic model. And there, there's quite a few grants out. There's there's, there's one being launched um, uh, next week as well, um, Product Development Award, um, where people can put work packages in to do health economics analysis. So you can wow. get it part grant, part grant funded. Big pharma obviously aren't applicable to, to apply for grants, but they have an incredible budget for doing health economics. Um, they hire, there are, you know, massive for profit health economic consultancies who just focus on value propositions for drugs and they make millions a year. So health economics is, is, is a huge market and mm. one not to be ignored, I would say. But for a no, indeed. Up, I would definitely say grant funding. And, you know, if anyone's thinking about grant funding, just, just get in touch because we help people write that healthy comments work package um and if you get funded then we can do the project with you the other thing just to talk about is it's not just money resource it's time these things do take time you have to have you know one or two health economists on your project for at least six months to a year so it, you have to sort of plan for time we we occasionally get slightly naive startups saying you know can you build one in a week and we have to say no um, it doesn't quite work like that you have you have to consider it as deep a academic endeavor as doing a clinical study or getting regulatory approval. Health economist sounds like a really interesting job. I imagine you work with health economists, obviously. Um, what what are health economists like? What have they studied? What do they know? What is their what is the skill set of a health economist or the experience even? Yeah, I mean, we have three health economists at Hardin, um, and they all studied health economics at university. <laughs> it's an entire discipline. Um, they, they can have PhDs in them, um, indeed. Wow. So it, it, it is a whole sector that, that has a very specialist niche. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's not something that, you know, you can do yourself in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and that, you know, the, the economic models do come out in an Excel spreadsheet, but they have an, <laughs> have an incredible amount of visual basic code behind them to, to run the complex mathematics. <laughs> and, but what's nice about health economics is that what you can do is once you've built the model in Excel, um, you can actually put that into either uh, into different types of code where you can display it you know, in an iPad app as a sort of sales tool for hospitals. Or, or put it on your website. So we, we've helped people do that where, you know, they can go along with their sales team to a hospital. And they can say, look, how many staff do you have doing this thing? How many cases do you see a year? What are your cost points at mm -hmm. XYZ? They can plug it into the app and it will come out with the numbers and charts and show them the potential cost savings and the price points and things. So it, you can build on top of it sales tools. And the other thing for the academics listening is you can publish these and get these models peer reviewed uh, as well yes. so you can add to your citations and and your and your academic index and things like that so it, it it's a really is a fascinating area I, I do not claim in any way to be an expert i rely entirely on my my team of health economists to guide to guide me but, but but this is a really really exciting area to be working in mm. so since we last spoke Generative AI has been all the rage. It would be remiss of me not to talk about this with you. I see, a lot, I mean, I see one LinkedIn all the time, obviously. And you are very good, I would say, at, let's just say, t tapering excitement where it gets kind of inappropriate, I suppose. 
where people are very excited about the certain intended use of a black box AI model that could be potentially dangerous. Mm-hmm. Diplomatically speaking, you know, you're, you're, you're not afraid to point that out, let's just say. Do you see the day where AI models are regulated? I know that you did the huge blog post on it of, of quite how that might happen, which I definitely encourage people to have a look at if they're interested in this. Do you see that day? Do you see that day anytime soon? And what do you think about this kind of feeling that I have that there are, you know, kids studying medicine or even doing a levels or even younger that are just thinking hey i can just build this generative ai based chat bot that diagnoses what type of headache i've got and this is like a 15 year old kid that's done it completely naive and oblivious and puts it somewhere where other people can access it and all of a sudden they've done something incredibly inappropriate there i say illegal like there's a lot going on right now with this and i'm just interested in how you see it all it really is a weird space, if you think <laughs> about it. We, we, as a civilization, we, we invented this new technology. What It's about a, what, a year and a bit old now, and the whole world is talking about it, and everyone's used it, and everyone is trying to apply it to as many use cases as they, as they possibly <laughs> can. Um, and it feels kind of like we've discovered fire, but we don't know how to control it. Mm. And we've put it in the hands of everybody, and it... To me, it just feels slightly dangerous. And yes, there's a lot of hype around it. But I, I think most people are sensible enough to realise it, it, it is sales pitches and, and, and hype. And you're right, I do call out extreme hype when I, when, I, when I see it. I think for me, what it is about large language models is that they are tantalisingly close to being good enough at a lot of tasks. Mm. Very, very close but not quite there. And that's not good enough in the very regulated world of medicine. And so, yes, theoretically, you can ask models like ChatGPT, what type of headache have I got? And yes, it can come out with a rather generic but very plausible sounding answer. Mm. But you've got to remember that this is a generative technology. It is not knowledge or fact or rules based per se. It is generative. In essence, at its fundamental level, it is trying to predict the next most likely word or sequence of words Mm -hmm. after an input. And by that very essence of its fundamental working, it will never be able to produce really niche, nuanced, rationalized thought processes because Human thinking does not work by trying to predict the next word or phrase. We use internal logic, understanding, facts-based reasoning, which this technology is not doing. So then you said, will it ever get regulated? And this is something that I don't know the answer to. One part of me thinks it is currently impossible to use an LLM in a medical device. Then another part of me really wants it to happen because it's quite exciting, but I want it to happen properly. I'll tell you a couple of examples where I think we might see it first get regulatory approval. I think we might see it used as a wrapper around a more deterministic algorithm. So what I mean by that is we might have a deep learning based algorithm, which can, you know, pull out information, do calculations that we can verify and check and that can get regulated. And the large language model might be a wrapper or an interface to allow a human to ask questions to a yeah. deep learning this factual model. So a front end, basically, yeah. Exactly. So, so um, or, yeah, the interacting side, either on the clinician side or, or the patient side. So an LLM might be part of a product, but it's not the bit doing the logic, the rules-based stuff. It's doing the interaction and the language-based stuff. So I think we might see it there. Where I don't think we're going to see things getting regulated is in the diagnostic space. Because diagnosis, by by definition, is is a higher risk class of medical device. It needs extensive clinical studies and needs traceability and audit. And the truth is, we we can't control the outputs of large language models. Mm. They have the potential for infinite inputs and infinite outputs. And as far as I know from the current research, we are 
not good enough at, at, at limiting those. In fact, I just was reading a, a paper this morning. Someone's mathematically proved that we'll never be able to solve that mm. with the current architecture of these of these transformers. Um, something else needs to be added in. There needs to be another technical computing layer that we haven't figured out yet in order to be able to get there. So I'm hoping that's the case. How would someone go about getting regulatory approved um, is, is another matter. I mean, you, you have to follow the medical device regulations if you are claiming a medical intended use. You know, diagnosis, prevention, yes. treatment, monitoring, alleviation of a disease or injury for an individual patient it is a medical device, however you cut it. Saying, oh, it's a co-pilot doesn't change anything or saying, oh, well, a human will always review the output doesn't change it. It's still a medical device. In the eyes of whom? Doesn't change it in the eyes of whom? Regulators. Right. You know, a human always checks the output of an X-ray machine. It's still a medical device. <laughs> you know, a human always checks the output of, of an ECG read. The ECG is still a medical device. So if you are a co-pilot and you are claiming to help people in the diagnostic treatment monitoring pathway of any healthcare condition, for an individual patient, you are a medical device, regardless of how often or how strictly a human reads your output. That's interesting. So what, what, if, what if the co-pilot doesn't analyze the information it merely summarizes the information that it listens to is that a form of analysis and is that a gray area or is there a black and this white is there? The gray area so there's a gray zone right. stuff that's not a medical device so that might be a large language model that interacts with the patient to, to book them an appointment yes it's not impacted their clinical care you just found an appointment for them that's yes. not a medical then you have medical device. This is an LLM designed to diagnose. You know, you give it your symptoms. It says your diagnosis is X. That would be a medical device. Then there's this gray zone, summarization. LLMs have this fantastic capability, as we all know, to ingest huge amounts of text and quite rapidly spit out a, a human written summary. And it can be fairly accurate at this. Not always 100%. There's still some hallucinations in there. And it, it can pass what's called the needle in the haystack test, where you, you, know, you give it a million pages of text well, I don't know what the limit is, but you can give it a lot of text and you can put one sentence in there which is completely incongruous with that text. It can find that. So we, we know that the LLM is, is reading, inverted commas, the entire text. And then it can form summaries. Now, is that a medical device? Now, this is very interesting because, and I'm going to go to the American regulation to, to give you an example. In America, you have medical devices, and then you can have what's called clinical non-clinical decision support devices. So these are non-regulated, they're called non-CDS, non-clinical decision support devices. And there are four criteria you have to meet in order for the FDA, the regulators in America, to say that you are not a clinical decision support device. And I've been on calls with the FDA about various summarization devices, and they have said that LLMs, used to summarize things, fail three out of those four criteria. And one of those criteria is that your system should not be processing or analyzing medical image or pattern or signal data. And the FDA considers text from a clinician or words from a clinician to be a form of medical signal data. So it fails that, that parameter. The other parameter mm. it fails is that the output of a non-CDS device should give options. It shouldn't just give, give one answer. It should give a range of options for the human to act on. And those options should also be referenced with citations or relevant evidence as to why it's given those options. And so summarization mm. terms don't necessarily do that either. Mm. So according to the FDA, a summarization LLM is a medical device. Again, it's, it's nuanced. It's going to be depending on your use yeah. case. In, these are the ones that I've seen. It's going to be a medical device and would require a regulatory submission. And now this is the bad news. Uh, you'd have to do a de novo submission because this is a new technology which raises new safety mm. efficacy concerns compared to any possible predicate device on market. And a de novo submission is not to be taken lightly. It is the most extreme regulated form of medical device submission you can do in America. Some logic behind it and some practical you know, insight there. I'm not saying that all summarization of everything medical is going to be a medical device. It depends what you're summarizing. 
Um, and we can go into the nuances of that if you want to. Well, what I was going to say is that if I'm on the other side of that playing devil's advocate, I'm going to say, well, okay, the output should give options. That seems like a relatively, you know, surmountable problem. Whether whether words from a clinician are determined a medical uh, a determined medical signal data, that's a question of definition and arguably semantics as well, and that's more of a policy change. Or in what what we're not questioning is the potential value of of this in that clinical environment we're not talking about safety we're not talking about any of those things and so actually i think it's fair to say that llms fail on that currently based on the definitions and based on what but you, as you and i as clinicians like i think the you know that co-pilot space the co-pilot space that listens and does the paperwork you know you, i think you'll probably agree with me that like that's that's somewhere that like you can you can transform like how doctors feel about and cl- other clinicians feel about their day job that's a huge place of extreme value that if we're going to try and get over some barriers there might be a place to do it you you could and it is poised as a transformational technology in that regard but we have to remember that the clinical note and the clinical record is probably one of the most powerful things that we have in medicine um and i say powerful because I used to be a radiologist. When I write a report, the clinician receiving that report trusts 100% what I have written in that report, 100%, and will act on it. They will operate on that patient. They will change their drugs. They will, they will do whatever they need to do. If you receive a referral letter from a surgeon to a GP, the GP will do what the surgeon has written in that letter. It's so powerful. It impacts the, the care of that patient. Whether it's medical signal data or not, you're right, is a nuance. Now, of note, that guidance was published a month or just a couple of months before ChatGPT was launched. So <laughs> that did not exist as that mm-hmm. guidance was published. I would not be surprised if people lobbied to try and get that clarified. Mm-hmm. Or I would not be surprised. And regulations do change and they do shift. And so they should if the FDA you know, would, were to change their mind or clarify that guidance. But it's going to be, it's going to take time. The regulations take time to change. Mm. What what I don't want to see is people almost deliberately bypassing or skirting these regulations. Mm. Um, if there is any doubt that their product is not safe, it should not be used in medicine. It has to pass what I call the grandmother test. Would you want it used on your grandmother? How how upset would you be if you know you've been to see a doctor and an LLM had been used to ambulantly dictate the clinician notes and there was errors in that record? You've got to also remember that humans have a right to deny any algorithmic processing of their data if they want to. So we have to put in place systems for for LLMs not to be used for those patients who don't want them to be used, whether or not the hospital or the clinician likes to use them. So, yes, I agree. Hugely transformational, potentially, but also massively risky. Mm. And the biggest risk I'm worried about is what I call the exponential hallucination problem, which I'll explain as best I can. Basically, we know that large language models can hallucinate. Even if we have a very good large language model which hallucinates less than once per clinical consultation, in theory, every consultation we have could have just under one small error in it, small inaccuracy or inconsistency. If large language models are then deployed at scale, That means that every single time you go and see your doctor and every single time a nurse or a physiotherapist or anyone writes a clinical note and an LLM process it, there could be an error added into the health record. If we then add in summarization to summarize all of those records, those errors will get propagated and amplified throughout the system. And this is why I call it the exponential hallucination problem. If in a theoretical scenario, every single hospital record was processed by an LLM. We would never be able to know what was correct or not because the errors would be compounding and exponential throughout the system. And this goes back to our other conversation on what the EU AI Act defined as systemic risks. 
Mm. It would be a massive systemic risk to a healthcare system to have widespread undetected inaccuracies within its health, electronic mm. health record. Mm. So I'm not saying this is proven yet. This is a theory. Now, mm. the counter argument is, well, humans make mistakes. Yeah, of course oh, we I, make mistakes. I have a few counter arguments ready. So. <laughs> exactly. But let's do, let's do the human makes Of course, humans make mistakes. One of the biggest sources of, of, of patient harm is, is human medical mm. error. Of course it is. Indeed. So we have to quantify that and then use that as a benchmark. We call it in regulatory terms state of the art. What's state of the art for this kind of mistake? We have to figure out what that is. But then we also have to factor in that humans can correct those mistakes. They can also dismiss the mistakes of others. And humans are incapable of summarizing 100 other people's clinical notes into one in, in a couple of seconds. We, can't, we, we just can't do that. So the propagation of human errors is much lower um, than it is with potentially with large language models. Mm. Um, humans can receive feedback and we can learn from mistakes. So that's one counter to it uh, as well. Mm. But all of, this, all of this is theoretical and it's just a concern that I have that I think may be shared by, by regulators and other people interested in this space. And I think it's good for the debate. It's good for the debate because it's it's those theories that I think the innovator in me and the 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 part of me that wants to see progress can take that information and then develop solutions to those problems. I think baked into what you said, I think there's a lot of assumptions that error means there's something added in, that it's pure machine on machine on machine with no human in. You say humans can, you know, stop the propagation of errors because they can correct things. Well, humans can stop the propagation of errors if they're the ones in the consultation, they disagree with that one sentence of the machine. So the human can be in to stop at that point as well. So I think there's, there's, it's, I, I, I like what you're saying, if only to get to a point of achieving safety with these things. I think it's relevant for that because we don't know what we don't know. And actually, we, we, we don't want to miss out on something that could potentially be harmful later. But I, yeah, I guess it's the innovator in me that wants to see progress, I guess. And I, and hey, if generative AI models can start getting regulated, then Heidi and Health does all right out of it. So you've got, you know, it's interesting that you know, I'm so bullish the way, but I, of course I'm, you know, saying that somewhat in jest. But yeah, it's it's I, I like that you defend this stuff because you've you've taken a, a, a moral position on it, regardless of you know the commercial benefits that you might have down the line. You've got a moral stance, and actually, and you're willing to defend it, which I I respect greatly like you james I'm a, I'm a clinician at heart by background it's you know I, I was never explicitly taught do no harm but it's you know that ethos is in our in, in our veins as, as doctors um and you know being a a regulatory slightly knowledgeable person about regulatory processes in health tech mm. I, I have it's just my in my natural instinct to to, mm. to think about these these concerns I just want to make one more point on the errors. It's not just errors of hallucination or errors of addition. It's errors of omission as well. It can be just as important mm. um, um, a risk to, to omit something, you know, omitting someone's aller allergy status, for instance. Mm. You know, it could be, could be fatal. So it's, mm. it, there, there's different types of errors. And I think what we really need to do uh, – as, as scientists, because that's what we are, is actually try and quantify what are these error rates, which ones are important. And then, as you say, try and figure out solutions to, to solve these problems. I am also pro-innovation uh, completely. <laughs> that's, that's why I'm in health tech. Mm. But um, it has to be done safely. Uh, I, I'm yeah. sure everyone agrees. Yeah, you're right. I, I think it's just interesting, though, because of that that summarize, this this sort of summarization vignette that we've gone through here unlike when you talk about this for diagnosis you know here is a history diagnose the top you give me the top 10 differential with a percentage chance unlike that 
these things seem somewhat like we, we can we can get over these problems like i th- i think i see a way very practically that these uh issues can be overcome and then provide a real significant amount of value in healthcare um but yeah you mentioned you mentioned the fda what's the difference with where we're at in the uk with this uh, and i guess I'm seeing so many people, as I'm sure you are too, like anyone that raises in the UK needs to have the US on their slide to their investors with their total market size. It obviously includes the US or else they can't, you know, they they can't attract the VC money. So everyone from raising in the UK wants to get to the US eventually. Of course, not everybody, but most. What's the difference between the two? And actually for people going to the US, what do they need to be considering here? You're right. The US is a super attractive market, both in terms of just the the, the amount of people, but also the amount of money. That's and they pay for stuff. They do actually buy stuff. And they have a private, largely private healthcare system where there is money to pay for things. Um, so the US obviously is a very attractive market. So two things that, in my experience, are quite interesting about the US. First of all, they are seen to have in theory, a lighter regulatory route for for things that are medical devices. They have something called the 510K process, where you don't necessarily have to do full clinical evidence, real-world generation evidence of of your device. You can say, look, I am substantially equivalent to a predicate device, something that's already on market. But that limits you to only making the same claims um, as that predicate device. And the predicate system has been the subject of some controversy because essentially it allows scope creep across devices. Um, For instance, you can have sort of one predicate device, which, you know, an AI deep learning model to look at fractures. And then someone else can say, well, mine doesn't look at fractures, but it looks at, you know, skin lesions or something. And potentially you can use that as a predicate device. And they're not exactly the same. And the two AI models aren't the same. They were trained on different data. But nevertheless, the FDA does have various product codes, and so you, you can try and claim equivalence to a, to a previously cleared product. It also comes with the with catch of intellectual property. Um, so you have to claim to the federal government of America that you are the same as someone else's device. That means that it's very, very hard to claim that you own a patent on your device because you've already told the government that you're the same as someone else's. And this has been borne out in lawsuits. So we've seen um, Apple, I believe, got successfully sued by Massimo for their blood oxygen saturation device because Massimo had the original and Apple wow. is a predicate. So th- these things happen. Um, th- th- there's catches. So whenever someone says, look, this is the cheaper, quicker route, you have to think, well, why is it cheaper? cheaper and mm. quicker? Because you are limited in your claims and you are limited in your intellectual property rights. That's why it's cheaper and quicker. And some really interesting data came out. I think it was a CB Insights report that actually looked at med tech exits over the past decade. Mm. And this doesn't include just software. This is, you know, other medical techniques like physical devices. And they actually looked at what funding went into those companies, and what exit multiples they got and how long it took them to exit. And what's really fascinating about that data is that the companies who got de novo clearances, i.e. they had not claimed a predicate, they'd done the full, lengthy, more expensive regulatory approval, actually had taken on less investment, they had got to market quicker, and they had, on average, 6.6 times bigger exit multiples. And that is because they are making devices that are new, they are unique, and they actually have a proven impact. The FDA said, yes, yeah. you know, that actually works. And so when I get clients coming to us saying, yeah, we're going to go to America, we're going to do a 510K because it's quick, I say, hang on a sec. Did <laughs> you know that if mm. you slow down a little bit, go for the big guns, go for the de novo, you actually have more chance of success in the long run. Mm. And it, it goes back to the old fable of the tortoise and the hare. And we all know who wins the race. It's the tortoise. Mm, indeed. Before I let you go, mate, obviously, well, I actually had you on the Pigeon podcast a while ago to talk about um, talk about Babylon and everything that happened there. 
How's that been since? Have you had any uh, have you had any kickbacks from any of that media stuff you did? <laughs> no, 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 not not at all. Uh, I think it, it, it's all faded away. I, I think someone is making a Netflix series about it, but I, I don't know. Much <laughs> right, okay. People are writing books on it. It's it's not quite a bigger scandal as the Theranos scandal, where actual criminality was involved. Um, but I don't. I have a sneaking suspicion we haven't heard quite heard the end of it. But I hope that people look at it and learn lessons about not to scale too big too quickly um, mm. in health tech. Um, it, it, this is a long, long journey. You know, it takes a drug 14 years to get to market. It takes a medical device 10 years to get to market. Software can be slightly quicker, but not much. So this is a long slog. It's a marathon. Be prepared. Mm. Well, thank you, mate. Thank you for coming on and sharing your wisdom as always. If people want to learn more about Hardy and Health and we get in touch with you, they want to learn more about health economics and what you can do for them, or indeed they want to get a full de novo, what is the best way for them to reach you? Just come to our website, hardyandhealth.com. Have a look around. Uh, we've, we've tried to be as transparent as we possibly can about all the services that we offer and the, the things that are required. And then just fill in the contact form and we'll be in touch. Awesome. Been a pleasure, mate. Thank you. Thank you very much.